Hi, everyone. We are live and we're so excited to be live. Welcome to our book club discussion of A Flicker in the Dark with Stacey Willingham, who's going to be joining us shortly for this fabulous novel that we got an extra week to ponder over it. <laughs> and um, I'm here with my co host, Brenda. Hello. And <laughs> we're so excited for this discussion and at the end of the show and our after show we're going to talk just a little bit about the Zibby Awards that we are nominated for and we're going to New York this week. But without further ado, Brenda, do you want to introduce our fabulous, amazing guest? I would love to because I'm just so fascinated by this book. But at any rate, we'd like to introduce our special guest tonight, Stacey Willingham. She's the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of A Flicker in the Dark, as well as the upcoming All the Dangerous Things. Before turning to fiction, she was a copywriter and brand strategist for various marketing agencies and earned her BFA in magazine journalism from the University of Georgia and her MFA in writing from the Savannah College of Art and Design. Her work is currently being translated in over 30 countries. She lives in Charleston, South Carolina with her husband, Britt, and Labradoodle Mako, where she is always working on her next book. We're so excited to welcome Stacy tonight. Hello. Yay. <laughs> I'm so happy this is working this week. <laughs> yes, Take we are two. too. <laughs> Guys yeah, so that much was for having crazy, me. That was a crazy time last week. Thank you so much. <laughs> we are just, we're really looking forward to talking Flicker in the Dark with you tonight. Me too. And I, I will admit to you that it's not my usual genre to read. And I was nervous I would be too scared. And, you mm -hmm. know, I'm not, I'm not this thriller person like Lisa, but I'm telling you, it was such a page turner and layers of suspense, which we can talk more about later. Later. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Stacy. And to our book club members who are watching tonight, please feel free to put any questions for Stacy in the chat box for live questions. And remember, we're spoiler free until 715. But after that, all bets are off. And so we got lots of time to get into the details of the suspenseful read. So, Stacy, for those who haven't read it yet and who are staying on till 7.15, could you give us a summary of the book? Yes, absolutely. So, A Flicker in the Dark is my debut. It was published in January of this year, and it tells the story of Chloe Davis, who is a psychologist from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, with a troubling past. When she was 12 years old, her own father was convicted as a serial killer in their very, very small town. And in the 20 years since that have, um, that have progress she's managed to piece her life back together you know obviously she went through something very traumatic but she runs her own thriving practice now she's engaged to be married um but on the eve of the anniversary of her father's arrest girls start to go missing in a eerily similar fashion so that is the that is the bird's eye view <laughs> oh wow this book was so suspenseful Thank you. It really was. And it, it's, it sticks with you. And there's just when you think you know what's going on, you're like, nope, you don't. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's a, there's a few twists in this one. My hope was, um, you know, even if with a thriller, it's so tough to, it's so tough to surprise everyone. People who are, who read a lot of thrillers are very good at picking up on what's a, what's a red herring and what's a true clue. And my hope was that at least one of the twists would, would get you. So you would, uh, you would end the book feeling satisfied. Definitely. Definitely. It was so good. And, um, our book club members are, our chat right now is exploding with hearts. Oh yeah. <laughs> and we've got some I have one question that I don't think will be a spoiler and I'm I want to know this too so I'm going to yeah. jump right in. Edie would like to know if you listen to true crime TV or podcasts. And if you do, I'm going to tack on I'm going to piggyback off that and ask if you could share which ones you listen to. <laughs> oh yeah. Yes, I absolutely do. I think you, in order to write about something like a serial killer, I think you kind of have to be a, a bit fascinated in true crime. Um, and so, yeah, I, I grew up, a lot of people are wondering what my, 
kind of wonder what my inspiration was for this kind of book. And it wasn't inspired by a particular person or a particular serial killer, but I was um, watching a documentary uh, a couple years ago about, I can't even remember what the documentary was, but it was about serial killers. And this one um, picture showed up of uh, Dennis Rader, also known as BTK, walking his daughter down the aisle at her wedding. And at that point, he had killed 10 people and he hadn't been caught yet. And so nobody knew, including his family, who he really was. And um, seeing that on my television screen, and I was actually in the process of planning my own wedding at the time. So it was kind of top of mind thinking about my dad walking me down the aisle. And do you, do you ever really know anyone, even your own family, was kind of the, the inspiration for it. Um, so when it comes to what I watch, I, I grew up on things like Forensic Files and Dateline. That was kind of my early um, introduction into true crime. And when I say I grew up, I started watching them in like high school. So I was, I was definitely old enough <laughs> to be consuming that kind of thing. But, and then when podcasts came out, Serial is what got me really into podcasts, uh, true crime podcasts, I think, along with most people. Um, there are a lot of people. I love uh, Crime Junkie. If anyone listens to Crime Junkie, I love um, a podcast called Morbid, which is similar, very similar to Crime Junkie. Um, there's one called Sword and Scale that I listen to on occasion. It can get a little dark sometimes if, if you don't mind that. That one is, is definitely darker than something like Crime Junkie. Um, and then there's actually another podcast that I listened to while I was writing a flicker in the dark because I wanted to, um, really get inside the mind of a serial killer's daughter called happy face. And it is narrated by the daughter of a serial killer. So, um, wow. Th yeah, that helped me really get into her head and, and make sure I was on the right track when I was thinking about kind of the psychological repercussions of, of growing up with a father like that wow I, I can imagine that that photo of the btk killer because at that point he's just the dad walking his daughter down the aisle and that's so interesting that that was an Ugh. inspiration not an inspiration yeah. but you, you know right it, it, what should i say yeah. trigger <laughs> yeah 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 you know it's because when you, you know, she, that's a real, that's a real person, you know, she's a, a real person out there who lived through something really traumatic. But I think that picture made me think of how we don't often hear the stories from the family, you know, that the serial killer, we hear his story and we hear the detective stories and we rightfully hear the victim stories, but the families of the serial killers, we don't really get their side of the story. And oftentimes they're villainized by association, which, you know, Chloe kind of deals with in, in the, um, in her hometown. And um, so, yeah, seeing that, it just was kind of a light bulb moment for me that, you know, being the daughter of a serial killer, you're, you're tricked in such an intimate way. You're supposed to feel safe with your own father. And, and um, what if that was never the case all along? How, how would that um, then influence the rest of your life? Wow. And, and that just makes me think of your prologue because the first, the very first words you say are, I thought I knew what monsters were. And yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I, I don't, every writer writes in their, in their own way. Sometimes writers will, you know, start in the middle of their book or they'll hop around. I write from beginning to end. And so I thought I knew what monsters were, was literally the first sentence I wrote of a flicker in the dark. And I think I was, try I was trying to put myself in Chloe's shoes and think, okay, as a 12 year old, what are monsters? You know, there are th these things under the bed or there are strangers, you know, strangers walking around in the dark. And uh, they're a scary movie that kind of gives you nightmares. Like monsters aren't, aren't your dad. They're not your parents. You know, they're not the people that you should, that you inherently trust. Um, yeah, it's just kind of a, to, to think about you know but I think that's what makes her hopefully an interesting character oh I absolutely read, um oh I'm sorry Brenda no I just um, said absolutely there is that opening line was probably one of the best opening lines of a book I've read in forever and oh, thank you in the chat, one of our book club members Dallas Strawn said one of my favorite opening lines of 2022 oh thank you and um, 
we have there's just so much love people are just so excited and thankful oh, that thank you, you rescheduled so we <laughs> want to thank you again yeah of and course then, and, and thank you guys also too. i wanted to ask you before the book even started the quote that you start that you started with that says whoever fights monsters should see to it that in the process he does not become a monster if you gaze long enough into an abyss the abyss will gaze back into you by frederick nice nietzsche? nietzsche god i'm horrible with names i couldn't even tell you i couldn't tell you how to pronounce it either somebody <laughs> needs to take um college philosophy <laughs> i was sucked in just from that quote before i even started so can i ask how did you find that quote or how did how did that quote inspire or did it inspire the book or yeah yeah you know i tend to find my quotes before i start writing because they sort of set the stage for me um i, I had an idea of this this book i you know a flicker in the dark the the basic idea was what would it be like to be the daughter of a serial killer and then how would that affect your life and what would you do if his crime started happening again when you're looking back on your life and all the red flags you missed would it change the way you acted the present so that was the basic idea and i thought about how sharing the dna with a serial killer would really really affect the way you viewed yourself would it be hard to think of yourself as a good person would you constantly be questioning your own judgment would you um ever be able to trust your own instincts like there's it would you in, internalize so much of that so that quote when i had the idea of a flicker in the dark i came across that quote and um i was already toying with the concept of monsters you know when you're a little kid a monster is something different than it is when you're an adult and um when i saw that quote i thought it was so interesting that you know if you if you grew up as the daughter of a serial killer it would be really hard not to get like sucked into that darkness and maybe become become something dark yourself and let it take you over. So if you if you kind of gaze into that abyss for long enough, it's going to then, you know, kind of um, gaze back into you. And I thought that was really interesting because in a lot of ways, Chloe is fight, pushing so hard back, fighting, you know, fighting her past and her demons and and trying to live this this, um, you know, normal life but um of course when the crimes start happening again she realizes that that she hasn't really dealt with it in the way that she needed to and, and it all comes crashing back so yeah fine for me the process is once i have the um initial spark of of an idea i kind of start looking for quotes that just feel right and uh the quote is technically the first thing that goes down on the page after uh after the title and then i and then i move into the prologue or whatever the first chapter is going to be amazing that's so cool um, thank know, you and you you feel so much for chloe too and she's so deeply flawed because of her experiences it it just it really makes you think my goodness yeah. well i'd like to backtrack for just a moment i know lisa has some questions um from people in the chat and we want to get to those just yeah. real quickly stacy as a debut author what what most surprised you about the success of this amazing book oh man Just. so much it you know it, when it's your debut you have no idea what to expect and it's it's i think authors what i've learned going through this and getting to meet so many other authors is a lot we all share kind of a lot of the same insecurities we have a lot of imposter syndrome we work very we're it's an isolating experience writing a book and um so your biggest fear is that you're going to release it and either no one's going to read it or everyone's going to hate it. And so when you're when when I was working up to release a flicker in the dark, I just didn't know what to expect. And so I think the positive reception in and of itself has been shocking because I went from nobody reading it, but me and my parents to then the whole world having access to it. And you just don't know how it's going to go. I mean, you just don't know. And um so yeah that that has been shocking but also the whole book community i mean people the the book clubs like friends and fiction and all the bookstagrammers and the reviewers i mean they're so kind and i i didn't even know this part existed 
to be honest, when I was writing A Flicker in the Dark, um, it wasn't until it started getting, you know, the ARC started getting sent around and I started getting invited to book clubs like this that I really got to talk to readers. And um, I've been, it's been the most enriching part, absolutely, because you you work on a, on a book by yourself for a year or more. And so when you finally get to talk to people about it, it's so fulfilling. Um, so yeah, I, I think things like this have honestly been the, the most surprising part in the best way. Oh, that's so, awesome. Yeah, it, it, it has been be. so, oh, go ahead. <laughs> okay, you go ahead. It has been such a success and we wanted to congratulate you because it is a finalist for the book of the month, book of the year. Yeah. And so those of our members, if you're book, book of the month, vote, vote, vote. <laughs> Thank and you. And I think yeah. they announced the winners on November 10th. Mm -hmm. So make sure you guys vote because it's definitely the top Thank of my guys. list for this year. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And that's actually, you know, that has been another shocking thing is I, I've been a book of the month member for, I don't know, six years, maybe. So when they chose it, I was like, I have a whole library of book of the month books that I now get to put my own book in there with, which is crazy. And then the, the nomination, oh, awesome. the nomination was insane. And then even then becoming a finalist was insane. It all feels a little surreal. So um, yes, thank you. I really appreciate that. Congratulations. You definitely you. deserve all the praise. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Congratulations for sure. It, it is 717. So I'm going to go ahead and give the spoiler warning. Although this, this question from the chat is not a spoiler. So, but okay. we're going to go ahead and say it's spoiler time and yeah. I'll ask this one. And then I know we have some deep dive questions too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Anissa would like to know, what is a book that you read that made you want to be an author? Ooh, hi, Anissa. Um, we've, <laughs> Anissa and I have met before. So hello. Thanks for uh, joining in. And okay. There's a couple, I would say I have two. I, I can never give a succinct answer. I would say I have two for this. One <laughs> is um, when I was in high school, I read In Cold Blood by Truman Capote, and that made me want to be a journalist. So and the original goal for me was writing something like that, like In Cold Blood or All Be Gone in the Dark by Michelle uh, McNamara, where I kind of found a real case and then wrote a nonfiction book about it. And um, and then I read The Book Thief by Marcus Zusak, I think is how you pronounce his last name. And that book made me want to try fiction. So I think it's a little interesting because I wouldn't call that a thriller. And that's what I obviously what I what I enjoy writing. Um, but that book was written in such a creative way. It, it inspired me to to give it a shot myself. Awesome. <laughs> okay, Brenda. Okay. I wondered if you want to you want to <laughs> ask your spoiler questions first. Well, this isn't exactly a spoiler, but it could lead to spoiling. Um, we have a book club member, Irene Winter, who is uh, from Louisiana, and she wants mm -hmm. to know, why did you choose Growbridge and Baton Rouge as the settings for your story? Because they are so important to the story, the, just the geography and the feel. Yes, that's a great question. Um, I, I live in Charleston, South Carolina. I've been living here uh, for about 20 years. I moved away for a bit for college and then came back. And so I enjoy writing about the South because it's just all around me. When I am in need of inspiration, I walk around my neighborhood. I, you know, go sit by the water and kind of listen to the noises and, and look around and, you know, look at the Spanish moss and the, the mangled limbs of the oak trees. And it's just, it's what I see. So it's what I wanted to write. But when I thought about A Flicker in the Dark, it, it wasn't set here for some reason. I was wondering if I should set it in Charleston and it just didn't feel right. And so I started thinking about all the different parts of the South there. Um, for those of you who live anywhere in the South, you'll know there's the South is kind of a blanket statement, but also it's every individual pocket of it is so different. Charleston is very different from Louisiana, which is different mm -hmm. from Florida, which is different from Mississippi. And so I was kind of looking for very small Southern towns because in the past chapters, 
I wanted Chloe to be in a kind of everyone knows everyone little Southern town because it would be impossible for her to escape who she is. Um, so I wanted her in a, in a tiny little, a tiny little town and truly just in the process of looking at maps, I came across Bro Bridge, Louisiana. And first of all, the name is perfect because it's just a yeah. real, yeah, it's a, it's a really unique name. It's got that, you know, bro, which is very Louisiana. It's got the alliteration, which I love. Um, and then once I started picturing Chloe set in Louisiana, that felt right to me because I could latch on to the bayous and the swamps and the crawfish festival, which once I saw that was a real festival in Bro Bridge, I started um, looking at the, the crawfish festival website and um, that the crawfish festival chapter came to me in such an instant on that website. I was seeing the little um, little crawfish races and, and the swamp pop on the stage and so I chose Bro Bridge because it felt very unique and I could just see it there. And then um, Baton Rouge became secondary, mostly for logistical reasons. I wanted her still in Louisiana within driving distance. Um, I thought New Orleans would maybe be competing with, with Bro, Bit, Bro Bridge a bit because it's New Orleans is such a unique place. Um, but Baton Rouge felt great because it's unique. It's, you know, there's a college campus there, which obviously Chloe went to college um, at LSU. And her father was in um, Louisiana State Penitentiary up in Angola, which is actually very quite close. So I, I liked the idea of her being um, really only like an hour's drive away from her dad. She spent the last 20 years acting like he's dead, but he's right down the road if you think about it and he's kind of this like off the page antagonist always hovering over her shoulder so those were those were all the factors that went into it but um it started as just loving the feel of grow bridge and then and then the logistics kind of brought it all together from there oh that was amazingly tied together <laughs> thank you <laughs> Yeah, it's it's tough, especially um, you know, I was working a, a a full you know nine to five when I wrote a flicker in the dark, so I couldn't really just take off on research trips. So I've mm -hmm. been to I've been there before, um, quite a, quite a long time ago when I was in college. But I spent a lot of time on Google Maps satellite view, just crawling through the streets of Bro Bridge and trying to get a feel of what the buildings look like and what the little town square looks like and looking at uh, Google images of the festival to make it as, as realistic as possible. Oh, that's awesome. I know uh, the setting, it, def it really felt like such a part, it was such a part of the book. And I was, mm -hmm. it, your imagery was great too. Just thank you. Everything about this book thank um, you. was great. I want to say before I pull the next question from the chat, our members are, overwhelmingly responding to you being a finalist and they're like congratulations oh, congratulations yes. i voted for you i'm gonna vote for you congratulations you. so we've got some vote some voting members here that are are voting for you so we've all got our fingers crossed thank you guys so much i really appreciate it so um i have a question from jessica mm -hmm. and she says I found myself wanting to know more about the visits between Chloe's father and Daniel. Can you speak more about your decision to leave those details out? And similarly, did you ever think about writing or including any of the scenes of Chloe confronting her father in prison or once he was out? Yes, that's a very thoughtful question. Um, and I, I did think quite a bit about that. And it's funny in an earlier draft, several earlier drafts there was a confrontation between Chloe and her dad near the end and I had a really hard time getting that chapter right because um well for a couple reasons on the one hand I didn't want Chloe to go through the whole book picking up these clues and putting pieces together only for her to then go to the prison and or go to the penitentiary and have her dad tell her everything you know I, I felt like that might have been a bit of a flop like she's piecing together these these clues and then when she goes there and she tells her dad look there's there's these these girls showing up again there's something wrong her dad at that point 
clean to her in my mind. You know, if he truly was trying to protect, well, yeah, spoilers here for everyone who's still on the call. If he truly was trying to protect <laughs> Cooper, he, um, that would be a major red flag for him. And he would say, okay, listen, like I need to set this straight. And I just, it felt like a very anticlimactic climactic way to end Chloe's journey, looking for, uh, looking for answers only to have them just given to her by her dad. And so then I, I rewrote it a bit where she was there just kind of confronting him and, and they were dancing around it. They were having kind of having a conversation, but not enough for him to reveal anything. And then that chapter just seemed pointless. It was kind of just there for the sake of being there. So at the end, I, I chose to leave that out because in a lot of ways, this is Chloe's story. It's not really her dad's story. It's um, her story of how she dealt with everything that happened in her family and her dad's decision to kind of take the blame and things like that. And um, so, yeah, that, that's, I, I, I tried to work that in and I it just never felt right. And so then once I took it out, it, it felt better. And um, for me, I think there's also, I enjoy reading books where there's a little bit left to the imagination. And yeah. I like thinking about know what her relationship with her dad is like they have a lot to work through you know so he's mm -hmm. out and she sees that he's out and eventually gonna you know eventually that that conversation is gonna take place but I didn't feel like I could do I could wrap up I could I couldn't do that justice in the last couple chapters there's way too much history there for them to to hash out and I couldn't I couldn't it, it that could be a whole separate book <laughs> so yeah in fact, it could. Hint. Yeah. <laughs> well, that brings me to my next question. <laughs> Have you considered writing a prequel or a sequel to Flickr? I, the short answer is no. At this time, no. I, I am happy with the way I ended it. I like that there's so much left to be discussed. I think that's why it's been a, a fairly popular book club pick because there's so many yeah. different avenues you could go down. Um, but the positive of that is I it has been optioned to um, to be a TV show. Fingers crossed, hopefully. So yeah, and, <laughs> and if so, if that comes to um, comes to be. I have a very talented screenwriter who will uh, flesh out all those extra avenues with me. So, so that's, that's a way amazing. that I can, yeah, that's a way that I can kind of keep those stories alive and explore, um, you know, what was Cooper doing in those 20 years? What was the dad's 20 years in prison? Like, what was Daniel's childhood? Like, I mean, there's just so many paths we can go down. And um, yeah, I think a TV show is probably the best way to do that. Cause I, I feel like yeah. I could, I, I almost feel like I could make this a series with how many mm -hmm. different characters there are. So it would be a great series. And we were going to bring that up later, but since you did, um, we read that it was picked up by Emma Stone's production company for A24. Yeah. Yep. That is so awesome. I Everything A24 puts out is top notch. And I was so excited for you when I read that. So congratulations on that too. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a scary feeling handing over uh, kind of the, the reins to something that I care about so much, but um, yeah, Emma Stone and A24 really can't do any wrong in my book. So yeah. it makes it easier giving it to someone yeah. that I really trust. Uh, I, I think they're going to do a great job with it. I do too. Um, and what material you gave them to work with. I, I mean, I can only imagine how it's going to be. So thank you. Yay. Yeah, I'm excited. No, congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up for a moment. You, I, I think you said something really interesting about the trying the conversation with Chloe and her dad in the prison mm -hmm. and it seeming not to be the right answer. I really think that's that's interesting and true because so many of the scenes in this book, or not scenes, situations in this book are like mirages. You think they're real and then you start you know, and things seem to fall into place and then poof, it's gone and something else is in its place. Mm -hmm. So that that was kind of my takeaway from reading it. And I was so like, it was so suspenseful. So I have a question for you and for book club members for mm -hmm. the chat. Um, book club members, what did you guys think was the most suspenseful scene in the book? 
Mm -hmm. And I, I'll, I'll go ahead and share mine because um, while they're answering, because it was just like I was ready to tear my hair out. When, um, <laughs> she, when Chloe and the, journal, the, the journalist mm -hmm. drive away from Daniel's mom's house and she's screaming and sobbing for her lost child that, that Chloe knows something and is not telling her, I just, oh, mm -hmm. That just got me. Yeah, yeah, that was a scene. Yeah, and it's it's funny. I don't know what I had in mind about like the most suspenseful scene, but I have heard so many people, including my my own family, when you know when they read it for the first time, they said the scene when Chloe realizes that the ring she has on her hand is is daniel's sister when she realizes yeah. that they were like my my heart just fell and i knew that was like a suspenseful scene but the reaction that i've heard from other people that see that whole yeah. chapter seems to have resonated with people quite a lot more than i think i thought it would um which is interesting mm -hmm. yeah that would be a pretty that'd be a terrifying moment to kind of look down at your hand and realize what you were wearing that was a moment that whole like you said the whole chapter that was the moment for me was the ring yeah. and I was sitting there going oh like my heart was racing I was like oh my god this is insane I, this is crazy <laughs> crazy crazy and then um when Chloe was in the house at the end mm -hmm. to, I can't think of the daughter's name oh Riley. she went to rescue Riley yeah and she was there and when she turned around and saw Aaron there and he was like, oh, I've called 911. I'm like, oh, my God, he didn't call 911. <laughs> what are you going to do? Like, and then she left her phone in the car. I'm like, I know. What? Like, I know. No. <laughs> I know. Every, <laughs> every now and then you have to make him do something stupid. Because like with modern technology these days, like, like I'm wearing an iPhone, like an Apple Watch. Yeah. Like I could just call 911 now. So there's every now and then you have to be like, okay, they're going to. They're going to leave their phone in the car or else they the it's help totally is realistic. Yeah. Oh, it yeah. is. It it's is. Totally I realistic. My, yeah. I left my work phone home today. <laughs> you know, in moments when you need something, that's when you forget or there's always like something. And then people are like, oh, how can you? And you're like, no, it happens all the time. Very, very true. That's I know. So realistic. Because she wasn't that's expecting it. it to be anything, you know. She right. Didn't, so, but anyways, that was it for me. Um, the chat is exploding, but before I get to those answers, I have to share this before it goes away. Our book club member, Jill, said they're all about the prequel. They're chatting about they still want a prequel. So. Oh. <laughs> but she said a great prequel or a prequel would be good. It could be called A Glimpse of the Dark. Ooh, I like Ooh. that. <laughs> okay. So I love that. Maria said I was also yelling at Chloe when she left her phone. Mm. <laughs> Marilyn says I was totally spooked by Chloe having that feeling of being watched as she walked home, thinking, wow, mm. her protective father is watching over her or a creepy stalker is watching her. Then it was so cool at the end to think about how her father was looking out for her and her overprotector, overprotector brother mm -hmm. was watching her but was he also stalking her that's a good yeah. question yeah yep the ring a lot of people said the ring uh jennifer says when she looked in the closet and found the box oh yeah yeah yep, yeah, yeah. That was and the alarms one. kind of blaring in the background i feel like that was a that scene stressed me out to write, you know, because of just putting yourself in that situation. Like you could hear someone walking up the stairs, the alarms blaring in the background, you're digging through all these clothes. It's yeah, high stakes. <laughs> oh, yeah. that is crazy. What was your most difficult scene to write? Yeah. Endings are always tough for me. I rewrite the ending a lot, multiple times, so, you know, at least at least five, six times. And it's not so much, it's not so much that, that what happens doesn't change. It's the way I present it. 
because I think what is difficult for me is I spend all this time setting up the story and dropping clues and dropping red herrings. And then I get to the end and all that's left to do is tie it up. And so it's easy to do it very quickly. And then at a certain point when I reread it again from beginning to end, it's like the last 20%, you want it to go fast in the sense of, you know, you want people to keep flipping the pages, not be able to put it down, but you don't want it to feel rushed. And I think that is what I struggle with is I take my time with the majority of the book doing the character development, the setting and, and dropping the clues. And then when all that's left to do is wrap it up, it, it can, it can go really fast. And so I force myself to, um, go back to my original ending and draw it out and, and make sure I'm taking my time and I'm doing the ending justice. You know, I want it to be fast paced, but I don't want to glaze over things. I don't want it to be too tidy, you know, like that's not real life is everything to be so neatly wrapped up in a bow. So I try to solve, you know, make sure all the clues are, are explained, but, um, it's not the, just this neat little bow, uh, you know, it, it's, there's still th little things left for people to think about. Um, so for me, striking that balance has always been tough. Um, I, I was curious about, did you know from the beginning how it would play out at the end or were you working it out? Yeah, I, a, a little bit of both. I need to, I need to know a twist. Cause I think for me, the con, when I come up with the book idea, the concept I find is interesting, but once I have a twist for that concept, that's when I really start to get interested in an idea. So for me, um, there were kind of two different concepts in mind for a flick in the dark. The first was, like I said, and this is the one I have to kind of publicly talk about without giving away spoilers. What would it be like to be the daughter of a serial killer? And what would you do if his crime started happening again? But the second concept that I can't really talk about publicly is it's everyone's parents' biggest fear that something horrible will happen to your child. But what if your child is the one doing the horrible things? Mm -hmm. And right. those were the two concepts that I, that I married together to make a flicker in the dark. So I always knew, always knew about the Cooper twist that was always going to be there. But, um, Aaron, kind of came to me as I was writing in the beginning he was a, just a journalist and then I was like yeah like you know like he he's not quite who he seems to be and so his his true nature kind of came to me as I was going and um this this twist with Sophie kind of came to me as I was going because I needed I needed reasons for Daniel to be so um knowledgeable of Chloe and suspicious of Cooper and things like that. So once you start, I, you know, I need to know where I'm going. If I'm starting at that point A, I need to know what, what point Z is. Uh, but the, the road to get there is, is always winding and it surprises me. <laughs> <laughs> well, there were plenty of surprises for us. <laughs> oh yeah. I, you know, I, I think a big reason maybe why, why, um, that some of the twists paid off is because they surprised me too. Like that when I realized certain characters aren't what I thought they were, it, it, it kind of shocks me. And I'm like, oh, so then I go back and, and tweak things to make it work. But I think because it surprises me, hopefully that makes it a more authentic surprise for the reader too. Yeah, absolutely. So we have... Okay, so this question, I have been dying. This is my question. <laughs> I've been dying to ask this. Um, what was, well, it's kind of like a two-part. So why did Cooper convince Aaron Tyler to commit the murders rather than just do it himself? And what was the significance of the 20-year gap between the two? That's a good question. So I'll start with the 20 year gap one. Off the top of my head, I don't, there's the 20 years isn't so much of a, you know, a lot, again, a lot of that was logistics. Like if Chloe is an adult now, you know, she's going to be in her thirties, she's going to be established. She's going to, you know, she's getting married, but when it happened, she was a child. So like, what's a realistic amount of time where, you know, she's grown up, she's trying to put it behind her, but it's, it's not 
it's not behind her. Um, and then with something like a, a copycat killing coming back up, like a round number felt good. Like it's not the, yeah. it's not the 17th anniversary, it's the 20th anniversary. So it felt a little more something that would catch her attention. Um, mm. And, uh, and I wanted it to, to, to contribute to her sense of deja vu. It's, it's kind of mad, like, as summer's marching on and May's turning to June and June's turning to July, like her anxiety is getting heightened and heightened because she's, she's approaching that moment 20 years ago when her life just shattered in the present day. So um, that is the answer for the 20 year gap. It's not the most, you know, profound answer ever. It was kind of a logistics, a logistics decision, but um, with Cooper convincing Tyler, that is a, that one I'll, I'll say that I did a lot of research on, on serial killers and, and psychopaths and sociopaths and things like that for this book and what I found is there's obviously violent people come in all unfortunately shapes and forms and there's some people who have this just kind of like they're just bloodthirsty and they can't control themselves and they go on these rampages. And on the other hand, there's people who are, are quiet and calculating about it. And that's almost more terrifying to me, someone who can control it. And, um, that kind of went back to that, that original picture I saw of, of BTK walking his daughter down the aisle. He, um, did all of his murders before he had a child. And then once he had a daughter, he stopped for years until she moved out of the house again. And the fact that he was able to control it like that really scared me because it's like he knew. It's like once he had this responsibility in his life and he couldn't get away with it, he was able to kind of control it in himself. And then when it was convenient again to pick it back up again, he did. And um, so I thought it was, instead of Cooper just kind of doing it on his own, I thought that he was the kind of violent individual who, who was manipulative. You know, he manipulated his dad into taking the blame for him. Like he said all the right things to get this problem out of the way. He, um, he said all the right things to Chloe to make her feel certain ways when he wanted her to feel certain ways. And, and he knew the clues to drop that would make her, you know, react and make her paranoia kind of start to spiral. So for me, Cooper was, is, was smart enough to be able to use someone else to achieve the goal he wanted instead of being reckless and just doing it himself, which is kind of what makes him so scary to me is, is that yeah. he's, he's cunning like that. That and, was and a family, only a family member really would be able, to, well, that's not true. I mean, it could be other, someone close to you, but that it was a family member who could draw those connections all together. Yeah. It's just fascinating. Yeah, because yes. he he knew her so well. He knew her past. He knew exactly what he could say and do to make her think in a certain thing. And that's kind of what's so, you know, there's a little line at the end that says, like, I don't doubt that Cooper loved me in, in whatever way someone like him is capable of loving, you know, like he knew her yeah. so intimately, but like he also was using her too. And and um that's just the kind of you know, you know, he's a he's a psychopath. That's just the kind of person he is. Yeah, and, and would have killed her right there had she not mm. been, you know, setting him up, setting him up, I guess you would say. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's a complicated answer. I, I, I had to try to, for me, it just felt, you know, I was getting deep into his mind and like, what would he do? You know, he knew he got so close to getting caught and he was able to pull himself back. And, and so he, the manipulation was enough for him, kind of the control of another person um, to achieve this thing is why I had him use uh, Aaron slash Tyler as a vessel for that. So when you said you get, that you were, had to get deep in his mind, how, when you're doing the research and you're writing these characters, how hard is it for you to shake that off and, you know, get back into your normal life? Or do you, you know, is it hard to go to sleep? Do you like download oh, yeah. everything at <laughs> night and write? Like what's I was your wondering. process to yeah. get through that? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it can be tough because, you know, the research is, is heavy and I'm, you know, it's funny. My books are not 
violent. None of none of what I write is very graphic or violent, but it's it's mostly very psychological because I find that the most fascinating is thinking about why people act in certain ways and how their minds work and what motivates them. And so it, it's not so much that I'm researching things that are like disturbing, but I'm getting I do get very deep into the psyche of of not very good people and so that can be a little bit heavy sometimes um but when i'm working on a book i have a really hard time putting it aside i pretty much think yeah. about it 24 7 until i'm done with it so yeah i have a really hard time falling asleep not because i'm scared but because if i'm laying in bed and there's a, some plot hole that's bothering me like i cannot let it go and I, yeah, I mean, I, I wake up, I, I take notes on my phone and then I lay back down and then I wake up again and I keep writing on my phone and I lay back down. So it, uh, it's, um, I, you know, I, I, I try once I have a draft done and it's kind of in other people's hands, that's when I try to just like decompress and consume other things <laughs> that can get my mind off of it for a little bit. I bet that's <laughs> tough. I, I got my degree in theater arts and I've done theater and acting and things, you know, and I had to play a character once that was very flawed. Yeah. And I found it hard when I was doing that show to, to get out of it. Yeah. And I always like to ask that question to people because some people are like, oh, you know, it's like clocking in and out at work. It's like, as soon as they're done, they can check out. And then others of us are like, she followed me around for two months after I was done, you know, and it's, you know, it's, it's just, you never know. So. Yeah. I, me. yeah, it is, you know, I've never drawn that parallel before, but it is kind of like actors. Like if you're putting your whole heart and soul into this one character and it's a dark mm -hmm. character, it's going to kind of put you mm -hmm. in some dark places. And, and yeah, for yeah. me, I, I, I get to know these characters so intimately and I, um, and with them every day for a year. And so I can't just forget about them when I close my yeah. laptop. It's just not possible for me. I don't know. It's really kind of envious of <laughs> the authors that can do that because I, I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So cool. Well, speaking of um, characters and, and stepping away, um, we know that you have a new book coming out, All the Dangerous Things. It'll be in stores on January 10th, 2023. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a, a preview of your new novel? Yeah, and I actually, I have an ARC of it right here. So this Yay! is what it looks like. Yeah. Um, yeah, I am, I am so excited. It's, um, yes, yeah, so it's All the Dangerous Things, and it is about a woman named Isabel who wakes up one morning to find her worst nightmare has come true and her uh her son her to toddler son mason has been taken out of his crib in the middle of the night while she was asleep in the next room so uh as a result of that she develops a pretty severe case of insomnia she um, has kind of committed her life to of course trying to figure out where he is and what happened to him but because she was asleep when he was taken every time she lays down in bed it's just kind of his face burned into her brain and she she can't go to sleep. And so um, a year passes, he's still missing, you know, no, no solid leads. It's pretty much going cold. And um, she enrolls the help of a true crime podcaster to try and get her story out there uh, to a wider audience. But his kind of uncomfortable questions paired with the, um, the sleep deprivation that causes her mind to kind of, it, she's, she's trudging through pluff mud her mind is moving so slow and she's so sleep deprived um it all kind of comes to a head so that is what all the dangerous things is about it's, it's similar to a flicker in the dark in a lot of ways it's set in the south it's another past and present storyline it's a um you know a, a clearly a somewhat unreliable narrator because of that sleep deprivation but um it has a very different very different plot very different kind of ultimate um theme it's uh yeah i'm excited about it i i, I love it i'm really excited so only All a couple right. months yeah yeah and again for for our book club members that's january 10th 2023 well also stacy we were wondering if you could tell us what events you have coming up and anything that you would like to promote yes thank you so much for asking i i'm you know it's the end of october 
I'm going to actually pull up. I have an event schedule here somewhere to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. My events for this okay. year are, um, are starting to dwindle a little bit. I have a couple more big book clubs. I'll be at the Georgia Writers Museum on December 6th. So anyone who's in Georgia. Yeah, I know. Lisa, you are, Lisa, Lisa, Lisa. Yeah. Oh, wait, December 6th. Yeah. Is that what you said? December 6th? December oh, 6th. man. I won't be here. I'll be coming <laughs> home from Cancun. Okay. Well, that's, oh, that's poor so thing. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So a couple of virtual events. I'll be at the Georgia Writers Museum in December for any um, local South Carolina residents. I have some. Um, Charleston Barnes and Noble events coming up and then um, touring for all the dangerous things in January. So we're um, currently hammering out that schedule, but I'm hoping to kind of start talking about that. Once I have some dates and locations, I'll be going to quite a few places in January. So I hope you guys Very are cool. nearby and you can make it. Yes, I will definitely come find you on the road for sure. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and one thing that us Georgia girls, even though we don't live here, but you went to Georgia, so we mm -hmm. still, you're still a Georgia girl. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, we have to stick together. We do. We have quite a few people um, in the chat. They're super excited about your new book. So one question our book club members um, would like to know is where can they order a signed copy of your new book and mm -hmm. Flickr or you know, yeah, both. that's a great question. I would say, first of all, thank you for asking. I really appreciate it. Um, probably the easiest way to get signed copies would be to order them through a um, Charleston bookstore, because then I can pop into the store and sign them and personalize them if you want. I'm happy to make them out to you or sign them for a, for a gift or write any kind of note you want. So there's, there's three uh, local ones that are, that would work well. One is Buxton books, B U X T O N books. Um, another one is the village bookseller. And the other one is called itinerant literate. Um, so they all carry a flicker in the dark and, um, they, they'll all carry all the dangerous things and they're all within 15 minutes of my house. So, um, any yes. of those would be a good spot. Yeah. Oh, I recently wonderful. visited the it itinerant literate and yeah. they're such a cute little bookstore. They're adorable. They used to yeah. be like a bookmobile. They basically had a, like a, a big airstream that they would drive around and park at restaurants and stuff, which is a cute concept, but now they have their own little brick and mortar store. I love it there. It's so cute. Oh, what a great I, idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have a great staff there too. I, yes. I really liked that store. Yeah. yeah. Charleston has some great um bookstore options it's a it's mm. it's really a special place yeah well Stacey I wanted to ask you too well first of all I forgot to mention here's my Flickr oh I love it <laughs> Flickr <laughs> mug for tonight um where can we find you on social media if someone wants to look up some more information yes so I have a um Facebook page it's uh Stacey Willingham author is my official page um as opposed to my personal page, that's where I put all the book stuff. And then on Instagram is probably where I'm most active. It's at Stacy S T A C Y V Willingham. Um, and then on Twitter, let's see, what is my Twitter handle? I don't even know. It's S V Willingham. <laughs> <laughs> so I try to, I try to stay somewhat active on all of them, but I would say Instagram is usually where you can find me. Yeah. And we just started our own Instagram for the book club earlier this week. So Ooh, amazing. You'll, you'll be able to find us on Instagram too, <laughs> outside of our Facebook page. Yeah, I'll follow actually, you if I'm not already. I'm, I'm probably, I'm pretty sure I am, but if you just started it, you then are. maybe not. Okay, yeah. <laughs> we actually, after our, our, our take one last week and inspired us for other venues, I was like, you know what? We should go ahead and start that Instagram page. <laughs> So there was some good that came out of it. That's good. Yes. <laughs> so you, absolutely. You partly inspired. <laughs> <laughs> well, before oh we goodness. wrap it up, we want to, we, we like to ask our guests to, what are you currently reading? Oh, yeah. So I, speaking of true crime podcast, I actually just finished um, All Good People Here by Ashley Flowers. She's the 
host of Crime Junkie, if anyone's into Crime Junkie. So that was that was great. I love her. I love Crime Junkie and it was really good. Um, and right now I am reading Daisy Darker by Alice Feeney. Has anyone read that? It's really good. I just got it yesterday and I plan on reading it this weekend on the plane when we uh, go to New York. Very <laughs> Agatha Christie, if you like Agatha Christie. It's really, it's good. I'm actually blown away by how creative she is. It's very good. So um, Yay. yeah, I'm, I'm almost halfway done with that. So those are what I'm working through. I have a massive pile of books that I am always <laughs> trying to work through. So <laughs> I know that seems to be the common thread amongst all our book club members because we, we have so, TBR mountains. <laughs> I know it's overwhelming. Like reading gives me so much joy, but also so much anxiety because I know I'll never get to it all. And it just, it makes me sad, <laughs> but I try. I know it's hard, but each one is such a gem and Stacy, we just want to thank you so much for being yes. with us tonight and for thank spending you. the evening with us talking about Flicker in the Dark. Thank you. My oh, favorite my book this year. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's so good. And I can't wait to see what A24 does with it. Thank you. And I hope too. they film it in Atlanta. That would be awesome. You know, I, <laughs> yeah, that they do film a lot of things in Atlanta, don't they? So that, that yeah. would make sense. And they could, I'm sure, yeah, yeah. I'm sure they could find some some spots around Atlanta too that have a have a similar feel to it. Um, oh yeah. yeah, for sure. But yeah, thank you guys so much for having me and thank you for everyone who chimed in. Um, if there are any questions that, that we weren't able to get to, I'll try to pop into the comments uh, tonight and maybe a little bit tomorrow when I have some time and answer them for you. So I really oh, appreciate that would it. Be great. Oh, yeah. that would be fantastic. Thanks so much, yeah. Stacy. Yeah. Bye. Thank, thank you guys. so much. Bye-bye. Bye. We'll see you soon. <laughs> she's just a dream she is delightful i it, and it's so hard to believe that this amazing like twisty twisty <laughs> crazy uh psychological thing is coming from her brain i know i just uh i was blown away by her and you know for those of you that did not tune in last week originally we were scheduled to have this book club discussion last week and facebook had a site-wide outage where no one was able to stream live and we did not want to cut a minute short of this fabulous discussion because it would have had to it, if we would have continued last week it would have maybe been 30 or 40 minutes and that just is not enough time for mm -hmm. this for this book so we are so glad that Stacy took the time to reschedule and she was such a trooper last week during all of the stress and just even <laughs> that more whole half hour. yeah we had we had a half hour with her even though I was pulling my hair out me too <laughs> and I want to say hi to Meg I saw that Meg is on she checked oh, on hi. us to make sure we were live so thank you for that she's like it's so good to see you guys live without a hitch yeah she tried to rescue us before we realized it was a, a, a facebook wide yeah. problem but so we appreciate that meg she definitely helped us out so well, well i didn't want to, i'm sorry lisa go ahead i was just gonna say now that we've finish this we only have one thing left i mean i feel like there's something going on this week i don't know uh, don't, don't, don't we have know what to that do? would be ah. do we have somewhere to go or no. i feel like i'm gonna no, see no, no, you no. in person or something we're, i don't we're... know what's happening what day is it <laughs> it's um three days before liftoff <laughs> we are going to new york city as nominees for the Zippy Awards for Best Virtual Book Club, which we could not do without all of you. So thank you. I, you okay, Brenda? I'm, I'm sorry, I probably look You're like I you have the, Oh my God, I thought you were frozen. <laughs> I was like, what happened? The reality of it hit me all of a sudden. No, I'm just kidding. I, <laughs> you were so I, still. It was like a perfect, I thought you were, you were like, 
I'm like, ah, is it frozen? Are you okay? That's too funny. I was realizing, and I probably did look frozen. I was realizing, oh, I need to share my screen. So I, I, I can never play poker because, you know, it's just. It was like the perfect OMG face. And then you didn't move and I didn't hear any sound. And I'm like, are you okay? Like what's That's happening? That's too funny. <laughs> oh, but oh, there it is. <laughs> our um best yeah. virtual book club nomination for the zippy awards and we are so excited and we'll be reporting from new york city yeah we will and we get to meet up with some of our new york and new jersey book club members which is what what i'm so excited about me too um, me too oh we have some questions in the chat really um, Yes, let's see. Mary wants us to tell her about the trip so we can talk some about that. I thought I saw a question. Edie says, two wild and crazy ladies take on NYC. <laughs> That's the plan. Um, Connie wants to know if we'll be able to see the words online. Unfortunately, as from what we know so far, um, they're not going to be live streaming, but it is at a private location. It's fancy. So I think, but you guys know me. So stay tuned to the Facebook and our Instagram page. I will, we will post something. We'll try to do something we'll live. We'll figure out a way. We will, we'll post. Even if we have if to I do it outside. <laughs> We're going to share yeah. our shenanigans on our Facebook page live and our new Instagram page. If you're not following us on Instagram, follow us on Instagram at Friends and Fiction Book Club. It's easy to do quick stories on there. Um, so we'll probably do that and we'll post live on both pages. So definitely follow along. And we are so excited. Mary Vasquez, are you, send me a private message and let me know where you live. Cause she says, where's the meetup? I wasn't sure. We don't know all of the New York, um, unfortunately, if, where everyone lives. But if you're in the New York area, you can send us a private message. And when we figure out the details, we can let you know where we'll be. Um, I think Debbie says she's following us everywhere. <laughs> Molly is so excited for us. We are excited. Oh, and thank we're you, Molly. For all you guys. You know what? I was we are. I'm just excited to go and have an awesome experience with you and we're going to go see Harry Potter. We're going to meet the book club. I honestly, even though I have my dress and I got my award nails can you see those nails you guys oh my gosh she's rocking her nails my award nails done yesterday i honestly have not thought about the actual awards <laughs> i think you once that either. we haven't even talked about it you know i haven't thought about winning i just i don't even know i don't want to say i don't care if we win because that sounds i don't know how that doesn't sound right because i I care about just being there. It's just but such I, an yeah. honor to go. Like, I, I won't be disappointed. I don't think it'll, you know, I'm just going to be happy either way just to be there and meet oh, me and I mean, all the other nominees. Yeah. So to have um, such an awesome experience, you know, yeah. that's just what it's all about. So, we, and we're just so excited to have just this wonderful community to, um, to relate to and to be a part of we just really appreciate everybody yeah we're so grateful for all of you and just humbled by the whole thing you know we never thought anything like this could come of our little book club that was less than a thousand people when i when i joined on and now we're over fourteen thousand members in less than 12 and two years yeah, absolutely. Um, just incredible. So 
we're grateful to all of you. We will be posting, I think. We're going to be, it's pretty much going to be a zibby, a zibby week for us when we post. Um, our next book club is with Kristen Harmel on mm -hmm. November, I don't 21st. know. 21st. 21st. <laughs> sweetness of forgetting so we will definitely refocus everything to Kristen and her fabulousness probably beginning next week but I think we're going to be probably posting a lot from New York we leave on Thursday so follow along send us good vibes and we'll be sending you guys all the love and messages and shenanigans and Harry Potter photos <laughs> And book club photos with our New York girls. Oh, goodness. I might make PB wear a wig. Uh, what? <laughs> I, I don't remember this discussion at all. <laughs> okay, I'm getting silly, so. Yes, I think it's time for us to close for the evening. Yeah, I should probably eat. I have to pick up my mom from the airport. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you have a safe trip there and everybody um, have a great evening. Happy reading. And we are so glad that you were able to join us tonight for Flicker in the Dark. And if you're a and Book a of the Month book. member, vote for Book of the Year. Don't forget. Absolutely. Take care, Thank everybody. You. Love you guys. PB and J out.